Hello. I would like to ask you something. If I say a word like plant or environment, what is the first, uh, you know, uh, first image that you get in your mind? Is it like, probably like, a, I don't know, just imagine, plant or environment. Yes, perhaps you will think like this kind of image, uh, that is basically uh, uh, a, a nice garden full of nice plants or trees and things like that. Or perhaps like this, a pot plant, right? This is a, it's a nice plant, yeah. Or perhaps like an arboreum or a nice, you know, a mountain scene with a nice brook and trees, things like that, right? Probably that is what in your mind. So as most of the people's mind, if I say words like plant or environment. Now, I give you a, a small question here. What is the tallest tree in the world? Tallest tree in the world. Probably you know, I'm sure most of you know, the tallest tree in the world is giant sequoia, right? So how do we know this fact? Because this question comes in quizzes and standardized tests. So we were taught that way, the tallest tree is sequoia, the tallest animal is giraffe, things like that. Now I ask you a question, what if all the trees of sequoia dies, perishes? In fact, all the trees in the sense that it's only found in California and, uh, you know, in the uh, US and Canada. Now what if all tree species in the world something like 10,000 tree species in the world, all tree species perishes. What is the impact of it? We were taught in the school that the trees, like other plants, produce oxygen. They fix carbon dioxide, right? They do photosynthesis. So probably you might guess that if all tree species in the world dies, we will all be dead, right? Because there won't be any oxygen. We will be all asphyxiated to death. Is that right? It's not, really, because we have two key species in the world, you know, that probably none of you know. Uh, in my science outreach talk, when I say about these two species, your students can't even pronounce their names clearly, you know, inconspicuous, often overlook two species. These two species are Prochlorococcus and Sinecococcus. Prochlorococcus might seem to you like a tongue twister. What these two are actually, these are magic algae. You know, these two algal species alone are responsible for 65% of the global carbon dioxide fixation and almost 65 to 70% of the global oxygen output. So, you know, if you remember, if you can imagine a world without these two species, there won't be any oxygen. So all the life that depends upon the oxygen will be dead will all be perished. Only few bacteria that can that can live without oxygen, that is anaerobic bacteria, can only sustain. And these two key species of algae, also called cyanobacteria, are also responsible for the first photosynthesis in the history of Earth. That happened almost four billion years old. Even now, if you look, the oldest fossils, some of these oldest fossils, are stromatolites. These stromatolites are 4.28 billion years old and stromatolites are nothing but biofilms of these cyanobacteria. So you know how the dead body looks like of these cyanobacteria. 4 billion years old dead bodies. Now do you know how does it smell the dead bodies of these bacteria, the cyanobacterial prochlorococcus and cyanococcus? You might not even know the names exist right before this talk. But I'm sure all of you knew how its dead body stinks. Yes, that is basically our petrol or carbon, uh, you know, fossil fuels, right? Diesel, petrol or jet fuel, all these fossil fuels, the name fossil is, it means that it's actually fossilized carbon. So it's most of this fossil, uh, you know, the fuels of coming from especially the, uh, the petrol and petroleum products are coming from these cyanobacteria, especially these two key species. So how did they achieve it? Through a process called 
you know, carbon sequestration. That's nothing but photosynthetic carbon fixation. So extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, they fix it, you know, and they sequester. And once they die, their dead body sinks deep down the ocean. And on the ocean for years and years, millions of years later, they actually, you know, uh, they actually crush with extreme pressure to a fluid, the black fluid, the black gold. That's called crude oil. And the crude oil, uh, with subsequent purification, we get these, uh, you know, amazing products like petrol and diesel. Unfortunately, that is wrecking havoc on the exact same organisms because of the global warming and other subsequent, uh, you know, phenomena that we will actually be expounding thoroughly throughout this course. Now, you might know these beautiful organisms. You know, these are nothing but coral reefs, right? So, do you know these coral reefs are not really animals, but it's a, it's a symbiosis, symbionts, animal and plants. You know, animals are nothing but nidocytes, you know, nidarians. And nidarians do have internal algae, and these algal symbionts, also known as Zeus Santillae, these are nothing but dinoflagellate algae. These are extremely important. And if these di these algal symbionts dies, the coral reef are no more having that charm. You know, it bleaches. Probably you might remember this particular scene from uh, you know Life of Pi and uh, other. You know, if you have ever been to oceanic cruise, you know, long ocean voyages at night, you will see this kind of phenomenon often at many places throughout the world's oceans. And these are nothing but, you know, bioluminescence. So a number of bacteria, for example, Nocticula scintillans. This is uh, uh, it's an algae. It's a, a dinoflagellate. This is uh, bioluminescent algae. A number of interesting algal uh, species you will see that throughout the course. For example, these beautiful, charming uh, entities called diatoms. Diatoms are also brown algae. You know, and uh, other other algae is Botryococcus brownie. This is very very important these days because it can, uh, uh, you know, it can store uh, oil. It can produce bio oil. Uh, almost 40 to 45 percentage of its dry weight is or oil. So biofuel production, bioethanol production. This algae is a prime candidate. Now compare this to Jatropha. Probably all of us know, right? The Jatropha, the oil plant. The dry weight of Jatropha is only 35 percentage is the oil content of the Jatropha, but here it is 45, 40 to 45. So this is one of the key candidate for the fossil, uh, I mean, for uh, you know, for the production of the biofuel. Or the blood rain, the rain that is red colored. Do you know what causes it? Actually, in fact, our own group has actually uh, we have proved it that this blood rain, the causative agent, is nothing but. Uh, a terrestrial algae, the spores of the terrestrial algae. The, the rain is nothing but a spore dispersal mechanism of the terrestrial algae. So, uh, Trentipolia annulata is the name of this particular algae. So, all these kind of stories will be exploring throughout this course. The course that I'm proposing uh, is called the Algal Systematics. What you are viewing is uh, an overview of this particular course, the first overview of this particular course. The course is being offered by the Central University of Punjab in collaboration with Swayam platform, S-W-A-Y-A-M, it's a new MOOC platform of MHRD. So any student can take these classes throughout India. And if you register for these courses, and upon su successful completion of the course requirement, including the examinations, you can earn credits, and the credit can be part of whatever course that you are taking. For example, mass MSc in whatever field you are in throughout Indian universities. So this is a formal course, uh, a formal MOOC that is being offered, and it's called Algal Systematics. We'll see some other things of this particular course here. Uh, the overview of this course. We'll be covering seaweeds, the macro algae, the red algae green algae as well as brown algae, the thorough systematics of these three groups of algae and especially those algae which is quite commonly found in Indian coast. You see, I've been working on this field for the last eight years. Indian algae or algal biodiversity of Indian coast. So all these algae and how these algae are interconnected in light of molecular systematics I'll be expanding, uh, you know, explaining uh, thoroughly. And I will also let you identify most of these species. How do you identify? So main identifying features will be explaining for the course. 
and some of these algae that uh, myself and my uh, lab mates have uh, described, for example, Ulva Pachima, Cladophora goensis. So, all this we will explain to you behind the door stories. You know, how did we actually come across this particular algae from where and how, uh, what kind of studies that we did that and how did we actually publish. Uh, that these are, how did we describe that these are new species and what, uh, you know, uh, what inspired me to choose this particular name, for example, Ulva Pashima, which is a Sanskrit epithet, as you can see that, or Goinsis. And uh, other, other algae, uh, other algal uh, discoveries that we made, for example, of late we have actually made a discovery of invasive algae, Sargasm Zanki, in the coast of Tamil Nadu. So all these stories we will be explaining. Or Urvala Leptochete, which is an endophytic algae that grows inside another algae. This is the first uh, report of an endophytic algae in, uh, in the ocean. So uh, these discoveries. Along with that, we'll also be explaining some of the most commonly found algae in Antarctica because I was fortunate to be part of Indian Antarctic mission uh, of 36th ISEA, that is in this year. And I spent one month each in both of the Indian stations, Bharati as well as Maitri. So algal communities, which is commonly found around uh, these two stations, I'll be explaining as part of this program. So for example, this particular algae that I'm holding is called Hematocallus grandifolius. So pertinent identifying features and other uh, you know, important uh, facets of information, especially on taxonomic level 11 information, I'll be covering throughout this particular program. As well as another highlight of this program is that we will be covering uh, the life history of most important algae, especially those algae which are commercially cultivated. You know, for example, porphyra. Porphyra is the most expensive algae in the world because uh, you know it's an edible algae and it uh, it is in high demand. So the different life cycle of uh, most of the commercially important algae will be covering. Also, different. Uh, Cultivation methods, offshore and uh, foreshore cultivation methods. For example, what you see right now is something called Monostoma corrosiens. Again, that is uh, uh, the name uh, will mean, uh, you know, in it. So, uh, how these algae are being cultivated, different cultivation methods, as you can see here, four methods. So, we will be explaining thoroughly different methods of, uh, you know, algal cultivation, uh, you know, methods uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for the students. Yeah. So. Go ahead and take this course. This is called Algal Systematics and offered by Central University of Punjab through Swayam platform. Thank you.